Uh, my name is Eric Bushhaus and I'm a HHMI investigator and a professor at Princeton University. For the last uh, two parts, the previous two parts of this uh, lecture, we've been talking about how pattern is established in the early Drosophila embryo. And we focused on a molecule called bicoid and that is deposited as an RNA at the anterior end of the Drosophila egg during uh, oogenesis in the mother, and then is translated into a protein and forms a protein gradient uh, in, uh, uh, early, in the early embryo. And the model and the, the reason why this uh, protein, this bicoid gradient, is, in, is important is that it is thought to be the, one of the, the, ma the major determinant in establishing the pattern of, of gene transcription in the embryo, such that concentra different concentrations of the bicoid protein at different points along the anterior posterior axis are uh, uh, activate expression of particular genes like the hunchback gene in green here or the cripple gene in red. Now we've seen that if you examine this gradient in Drosophila embryos or if we examine the expression of the downstream targets we see that they're extraordinarily constant from one embryo to the next. And this is probably what you want if you want to have a system which is establishing pattern and controlling the behaviors of individual cells in the embryo. Now one of the, uh, and we've, we've, in the last lecture we talked about some of the biophysical parameters and cell biological parameters that might give rise to these constant uh, distributions of, of bicoid or the, of uh, constant transcription patterns. Now one of the underlying uh, assumptions for all of those, for all of that work, is that is based on actually a fact. If you look at a uh, fly eggs, uh, not only are the expression patterns constant, but the actual sizes of the eggs are constant. And that's an important idea because if you think about any of the mechanisms that we think about when we talk about how one would establish a gradient, they are extraordinarily size, uh, they're very sensitive to the size of the egg. If you want to establish hunchback expression up to 48 percent egg length, and you're doing that by having a gradient of a molecule that diffuses at a particular, with a particular diffusive constant and establishes a particular constant shape in its distribution, as bicoid appears to do, then that mechanism for patterning would be very sensitive to variation in egg size. And if you look at Drosophila eggs, particularly the way you raise them in the laboratory and the way that we've measured them, to, uh, in the stocks we've measured them to establish these gradients and look at them. What we see is that actually uh, individual fly eggs are remarkably similar. Wild type normal eggs are remarkably similar in their size. And so it's basically consistent that such a mechanism could function to pattern uh, embryonic development in, uh, in Drosophila melanogaster. The problem though with that model arises if you go outside of Drosophila if you go outside of fruit flies and extend your observations to other, other kinds of embryos, other, other, from even other embryos of other insects species, or even other fly species. As we all know, from our own personal experience, flies come in different sizes. There are the nice little small Drosophila fruit flies with the red eyes that we kind of raise in the lab and have such affectionate feelings for. And there are also disgusting flies like house flies and blow flies that kind of fly around and are, are, are in, invade our picnics and are, are, are less attractive. The bigger flies are the uglier ones, the smaller flies are, are, are nicer and sweeter, generally. Now, what is also true though, not only is the adult flies that we see are of different sizes, but also if you look at the eggs in the embryos that these different fly species they are also different sizes. So uh, Drosophila melanogaster, for example, makes eggs that are about 500 microns long. There are even Drosophila species like Drosophila buski that make eggs that are even smaller than uh, Drosophila. But there are big, the big flies like Musca, uh, house, Musca domestica, the house fly, or, or Califera blow flies, or green bottle flies, Ocilia, that are big obviously as adults, much bigger than, than Drosophila. And the eggs that they make are substantially uh, 
bigger. Now, all of these flies, these higher diptera, are closely related. And even though uh, bicoid, as an RNA or a gene product, was a, a, a newly evolved solution to the problem of patterning in the embryo and arose during the evolution of the diptera, all of these insects here share the common feature that their anterior posterior patterning depends on bicoid. And yet, the bicoid gradients that are forming in these eggs are forming in eggs which are very large or very small. Now, one of the interesting features of all these eggs, though, is even though they have different sizes, if you actually look at the development of these embryos, you can see that they're the early development is remarkably similar in that if you go back and remember how early development in, in diptera starts with fertilization followed by these nuclear cleavages in a syncytial embryo and then a pause at two and a half hours to form a, uh, uh, and, and then the uh, syncytial blastoderm that then uh, transforms itself by the formation of cell membranes between nuclei into a cellular blastoderm and a gastro. That process that takes about two to three hours in Drosophila melanicus is also observed in all of these other insects. And it also is observed with exactly the same time, two and a half hours, the same kinetics. And if you look uh, at the, uh, divisions of the nuclei, if you look at individual, say this is an embryo at the uh, syncytial Drosophila embryo uh, from uh, one of the big uh, the green bottle fly, Lucilia, versus Melanogaster, Drosophila Melanogaster, Drosophila buski. The eggs have the same shape, and although you can probably barely make it out uh, in terms of the, you can barely see the nuclei in the Lucilia and the nuclei in Drosophila Melanogaster buski are somewhat smaller, if you blow up the pictures of the individual eggs and look at the nuclear distribution, you can see that all these eggs at two and a half hours, have the same number of nuclei. They all have about 100 nuclei going from the anterior to the posterior end of the egg. They're all being patterned over the same time constraints. And they're all being patterned by bicoid. If you look at transcription, the other remarkable similar thing between all these insects that are also closely related, even though their sizes are different, is that uh, all of them activate transcription at this critical two-hour period in response to bicoid. And if you look at the patterns of gene expression, if you look at, say, hunchback or giant, the two different gap genes in uh, Drosophila or in Musca or uh, parallel genes like uh, uh, paired or even skipped, they show exactly comparable scaled patterns. Even though the uh, eggs are bigger and even though the cells are bigger, the patterns per cell are exactly the same. Now, these are transcriptional responses. They're genes which are transcribed at the blastoderm stage directly or indirectly in response to the bicoid gradient. And so the question that you'd like to ask is how is it, during the course of evolution, as egg size changes, how does the embryo or the species adjust to using a bicoid gradient to establish pattern? There are really two simple ways that you could think about it. One way is that each of these genes, like hunchback, but like in any of the targets of bicoid activation, is going to have a control region which will respond, uh, respond to, to bicoid concentration. And as you change the length of the egg, one strategy would be to keep the bicoid gradient the same shape and the concentration distribution the same and yet change the, the cis-acting control regions of each of these genes, adjust them during evolution. And we know that that's generally what happens during the course of evolution. Alternatively, during evolution, you could adjust with the size of the egg, not by changing the control responses of individual genes, but by somehow changing the manner or changing the physical properties that establish uh, the bicoid gradient itself, such that in bigger eggs, the gradient extends longer. Uh, in smaller eggs, it uh, uh, is shorter. This seemed to us initially a, a less likely alternative, 
part, partially because many of the cases in evolution that we know about are involved changes in cis-acting control regions. But when we actually looked at the bicrate distribution in these other insect species, what we observed was that not only does bicrate form gradients in big eggs and the small eggs, but if you look at the big egg, uh, if you co and compare the distribution to, say, in, in Melanogaster, in Melanogaster, the gradient falls exponentially over an area like this. And if you look in Lucilia, the, the distribution is uh, of bicrate protein extends much longer, much farther into the length, in, in, into the egg. In terms of microns, that is, the, the bicrate gradient in a bigger egg is bigger, proportionately bigger, because if we then replot the data, not in terms of absolute lengths as here, but in terms of relative lengths along the eggs, you can see that the bicrate gradients in the big eggs and the small eggs are exactly equivalent, scaled to the size of the egg. That, what that means then, in turn, is that somehow, during the course of evolution of these insects, the bicrate gradient has changed. The physical, the properties that establish the gradient have changed to allow this gradient to now span a bigger egg, uh, or a bigger or smaller uh, egg, and provide positional information along the whole length of the egg. So how does this happen? One simple strategy would have been would be to change bicoid as the species evolve. They change bicoid. They change the properties of the bicoid protein such that it moves faster, such that it is degraded less rapidly, for example, such that it ultimately the gradient that you get out of this bicoid would be um, would extend farther and thus establish a, a, a compare gradients of. of comparable shape when scaled back to the actual shape of the egg. To begin to test or think about those models, we've cloned the bicoid genes from these uh, different species and compared their, their structure to that of Drosophila melanogaster bicoid. And if you look at them, bicoid is reasonably well conserved, are remarkable, particularly in regions of the protein which are uh, functional, well defined, the homeodomain that binds DNA, or other regions that have been implicated, at least suggestively, as being involved in, in protein stability. The, uh, most, of these, the, most of the sequences are the same, but not surprisingly, when you look at any particular sequence, any particular region of these, these, these proteins, there are amino acid differences. And so one possibility is that these different, these different species-specific bicoids are, have evolved, and the changes in their sequence, either the ones that I've indicated here or other changes in other regions of the protein, are actually responsible for promoting those, uh, uh, the, the changes in the, adjusting the shape of the gradient such that it can now function in larger eggs or smaller eggs. So to test that possibility and to begin to hope uh, to identify the regions that have changed in the bicoid protein, what T uh, Thomas Greger and Alistair uh, McGregor in the lab did was to take these cloned bicoid genes from the other species, tag them with EGFP, and put them back into Melanogaster to ask what type of gradients that they make. And the surprising result here, one that we hadn't anticipated, was that if you compare, if you take a, a bicoid protein from Califera, for example, that will make a large gradient that ex extends uh, more than a millimeter through the entire uh, a Califera egg, which is uh, one and a half millimeters long, and you put it into a, a Drosophila egg, which is only 500 microns long, one anticipation, uh, one possible result would have been that the, this bicoid protein because of its changed properties, the protein that it moves faster, or that it degrades less, would make a califera-sized gradient in a Drosophila egg, and that would be easily uh, 
that, you can imagine that would result in a catastrophe for uh, uh, development for the, the Drosophila embryo that was depending on that gradient. But what you actually see, and the amazing thing is that these bicoid gradients that are established in these eggs actually using the, the Califer protein are identical, surprisingly identical to the not to the Califer, not to the gradients that the same proteins would have made in Califera, but to the, the, the gradient that's made in Drosophila melanogaster. So, for example, in this figure here, we, sure, we can see the Califera bicoid extending out in a visible sense to about 48% where it would be activating hunchback, and that's very similar to the uh, distribution that you'd see in, uh, when you took the Drosophila EGFP and put it in the same egg. And you can measure that and show that these distributions overlap. Uh, each uh, bicoid, uh, that regardless of the source of the bicoid protein, put into a Drosophila melanogaster egg, that, growth, that protein will make a gradient of the same shape, the same size as the melanogaster bicoid. So we know this is, um, so what that's telling us is that the dipterin, uh, uh, the fact that dipterin bicoids uh, uh, expressed in Drosophila make Drosophila sized gradients is that during the course of evolution, it's not bicoid that has changed to allow for the adjustment of the egg shape uh, and egg size, but some other property of the egg. So proteins put in a melanogaster, these proteins put in a melanogaster egg will produce bicoid type. Uh, will produce melanogaster type gradients. Now we've done the same kinds of experiments using other tag proteins, EGFP. We've altered the bicoid or we've just put straight, you can imagine just taking EGFP or EGFP with an NLS, a, a nuclear localization sequence, and uh, localizing the RNA to the anterior end of the egg and ask, will any protein, any GFP tag protein, put into a Drosophila egg make a gradient the shape of bicoid? And we found that that's not true. That the the, each individual protein put into the egg makes a gradient of a particular size in a particular distribution. But all of the bicoid proteins put into the Drosophila egg at the anterior end make gradients of a particular size. So the interesting conclusion then from these experiments is that during the course of evolution, what has been, it's not that bicoid has changed to adjust for the size of the eggs, but actually Bicoid has been conserved. What's been conserved in bicoid is a property of the protein that allows it to build gradients of a particular size when put into uh, Drosophila eggs. And all the, cons all the bicoid molecules, but other proteins, do not have that property. What's uh, said differently, what's actually diverged during evolution has been not the protein itself, but the environment that we put the protein in. Uh, such, and, and then that raises the kinds of questions that you would like to answer now are, what are those properties? What could influence bicoid? What's the, what's the features of bicoid, the bicoid protein itself that allows it to respond and make gradients. And there are obvious experiments that we're in the process of doing where you could take, uh, to uh, identify the regions of the bicoid protein that are essential for it to make a gradient of a particular size, uh, the particular size and shape that's characteristic of bicoid. And then the other question is, what are the features that change as you change egg size? that change those distributions? How is it that you're able to maintain the property of the protein on the one hand, and then change the size of the egg, and change the movement of the, the, pro uh, the, movement of the proteins? So those are, are, are really essential proteins from the standpoint of understanding how during evolution, or the essential questions for understanding how during the course of ev evolution, you're able to use the same, the same system same protein over uh, and over again, they will require different kinds of uh, measurements and being able to work with 
multiple species and multiple variants, both of being able to put big white proteins into melanogaster, but able to also put variant proteins into the bigger and smaller eggs. But what they'll also require is to distinguish between these different models and to, to get at the underlying mechanisms that uh, are controlling the distribution is again the kind of quantitation that we talked about in the, in the second lecture. And it's my own belief that the future of developmental biology of the, the, in general and the future of our understand and the refined understanding of problems in development will depend heavily on our ability to, to combine both those visual uh, quantitative visual techniques for analyzing distributions of molecules with the, the, the powerful techniques of molecular biology that allow you to manipulate the structures of those, uh, the, the, the sequences and structures of those proteins and also the other features of the egg. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attendance.